Hey everybody and welcome to Bright Founders Talk at Tammy. Tammy is an international software development company that designs, builds and delivers software for sustainable businesses and promising startups. Welcome to our podcast where we bring you the most inspiring stories of entrepreneurs and experts in the software development industry. Each week we interview successful leaders who share their unique journeys and valuable insight. Today we have an amazing guest joining us, Mark Seeger, who is founder and chief strategy officer at Glideways. Hello, Mark. How are you doing? How is your morning? Hello, Alexandra. It's a beautiful morning here in California, and it's an honor for me to be here with you. Thank you very much for making the time. That's perfect that you've made time to join us today. It's a really an honor. And so uh, my proposal, let's kick off our interview by delving into who you truly are on a personal level and exploring the fascinating journey that has shaped your unique background, your entrepreneurial story. My first question will be if you could describe yourself in only three words, which words would you choose and why? Well, I think this is the hardest question uh, that, that one can ask because simplicity is by definition complex. And so three words mm -hmm. that I would probably choose Uh, are number one, optimistic. Um, by nature, I have always been an optimistic person. I'm optimistic in people uh, and in culture, uh, in society, and ultimately in the world. That's just sort of how I think. Um, and I generally am, am wired or my default state of mind is to find uh, the opportunity, the optimistic opportunity in any situation, which is sometimes very difficult. Um, but that is what I tried to do. So I would say the first word is optimistic. Mm -hmm. The second word I would say is extreme. Um, I tend to, uh, and I think many founders tend to overreact, um, not emotionally, but I mean to a problem. We think of a solution and then a fix for the solution. And then how do I build the solution? And then how do I sell the solution? And then how do I get the solution to as many people as possible? Because we are optimistic in solving the problem. And so in many instances, I think of starting a company as an overreaction to maybe a problem uh, or an opportunity. Um, and, and that kind of goes good because starting things is hard to do and the world needs innovation and solutions. But when you have an extreme mindset, you tend to see things in black and white because you're forced to make decisions and the world isn't really black and white at all. And so that tension between the extremism, uh, not political extremism or emotional extremism, but, but mm -hmm. uh, executional extremism and the balance that is ultimately a human enterprise, which is what a company is, is a very difficult balance that I have yet to, to manage carefully. Um, so that would be my second word. If the first word is optimism, uh, the second word would be extreme. And the third word is a little, little bit more difficult. I'm still trying to find the right word to, to an idea um, that I am just recently understanding at my age of 43. Mm -hmm. I'm just now understanding this next word that I have chosen to use, uh, which is uh, humble or humility. And that's not a word I would have used if you and I had this discussion last year or the year before mm -hmm. or at point in time earlier than this year, because normally what a founder might say, what I would have said as my third word would have been confidence. Uh, I have a lot of confidence in my idea or in myself to execute an idea. I think what I've learned over time, and especially more recently, is that I may have some good ideas, but I have a lot more to learn than I thought. And accepting that idea that I have to learn a lot more from other people Uh, is a new idea for me, and that exposes some of my flaws. I don't mind being being very honest and authentic with you and your audience. Um, but it is an idea I'm just starting to learn to understand better. Mm -hmm. So the most important word for me is optimistically humble, if I can say that, combining the first and the third word uh, together. I don't know thank if that's you. helpful. That's how I think about it. Yes, yeah, thank you for this. Actually, I can say deep dive into your personality because... It's sometimes, I can say, uh, pretty hard to find those three words. Uh, you have a lot of ideas. Your, your head is buzzing with all of those questions who you are. 
<laughs> in only three words. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, my next question: uh, Can you share a quote that resonates with you personally and influences your approach to life and business? Yeah. This this your your questions are all very good and therefore very difficult. And when I think of a quote, I think of many inspirational quotes that have been said by other people other leaders, uh, philosophers, famous people, uh, your own president, for example, uh, has, has come up in mind and, and has touched me in many ways with some of the quotes he has said. But I think that rather than using someone else's quote, I will use a quote that, uh, that I've read somewhere. I didn't make it up. I don't know who said it. It's not a very complicated quote, but it really reflects the second word of my three words that I gave you a moment ago and my approach to life, which is the following. Anything worth doing is worth doing to excess. And what I mean by that is that I, I, I've always lived my life professionally in the entrepreneurial context that says, hey, if something is worth doing, if it is worth it for me to spend time solving a problem or creating an opportunity that I believe will benefit other people, uh, which is usually why you start a company. You're either solving a problem with a better solution or you're bringing innovation to the market in some way, shape or form. Well, then by definition, you should really put everything you possibly can into that work. You shouldn't do it halfway or, or partially. Uh, I only know how to do everything 100% or zero. I don't know the in-between. And the good news that comes from that is that you are very, very focused and you give a lot of energy and dedication to what is probably going to be the hardest thing of your life, which is starting a company or, or being part of a team that is starting a company, starting something new. But of course, the downside of it is if you live your life by that motto in a personal context that anything worth doing is worth doing to excess, well, you drive a lot of people crazy, in particular mm -hmm. my family. So it's just, it's a very difficult balance. and. As I've become older, I'm trying to to channel that in the right areas mm -hmm. and not everywhere. But that's a skill I have I have yet to learn. I think you've already mentioned those. Uh, we can say those three words. Uh, they also describing uh, not only you as a personality, but also your approach to the business, and uh, we can say the qualities which you have. And what other qualities you believe? Um, can uh, influence on the success of entrepreneurs, entrepreneurship? That is such a great question. I, I mean, there's many, but I would say a few come to, to my mind as probably the most important that I have leveraged throughout my journeys, uh, both through success and through failure. Um, and that is self-confidence and belief in yourself. You, you have to, I believe, you have to come to the conversation with your idea or your solution or whatever it is you, you are interested in structuring your company around or your idea around or your team around with, with the knowledge that and the conviction that is the right thing to do. And the reason why I say that is because an entrepreneurial journey, at least in my experience and in the experience of people I talk with, is so difficult. And it's difficult for many reasons, but one of the biggest reasons is that you are going to change something. You're changing human behavior, you're changing an industry, uh, you're maybe bringing something new to market that changes multiple industries or multiple lives. And oftentimes, change brings resistance. Mm -hmm. And that's a human, at least in the West, Western Europe and America, where I've spent most of my life, a little bit in Asia, I've noticed this too, where I spent a big chunk of my life as well. There is a resistance to change. And so what that means is you have to be resilient to the resistance, to the people who tell you you're wrong, the people who don't want to change uh, and who will, who will automatically assume an emotional reaction to your instigation of change that will be negative. And it will be tough. And that's on top of the difficulty of actually producing a new product or actually starting mm -hmm. a company, which is technologically difficult. It's financially difficult. There are always setbacks, some setbacks you can control and, and some you can't. Uh, Alexandra, you can experience that in your own country, something you can't control that is a very difficult yes. thing to deal with, right? As your, your brother and sister citizens are dealing with 
with an enormously difficult situation. And you can't control that. And the only way through all of those difficulties, I believe, for me, has been the resilience to those difficulties that comes from confidence in yourself and in your idea. And do not let other people who will tell you you're wrong and tell you you're doing the wrong thing and try to resist you, do not let them repress your idea or your enthusiasm or your energy or even your idea. I believe that even sometimes it's good when someone say you that it's wrong um, and something like this because they are challenging you and uh, you may even try to make your product better with, the, with all of these comments from others. Uh, yes. Okay, uh, now we will smoothly move to the more business question regarding your company, which is really connected with your company. Uh, imagine you have the power to magically transform any existing city's transportation system in a, a, into a futuristic uh, glide waste network overnight, just one night. Which city would you choose and why? I have thought about this question uh, a lot when you shared this ahead of time. Um, and I have an answer, but I want to explain my answer first. Mm -hmm. um, in the world that we live in today, approximately half of the entire human population lives in an urban or city environment today. And that trend is increasing. More people are moving to cities and cities are getting better. And so urbanization is a global trend that itself is going faster. It is accelerating. And then if you say, okay, how many cities today exist that are of a population size and a population density where you need, where you have a difficulty of moving around that city, where access to mobility is difficult uh, because too many people want to use the roads, then the road can handle and you have congestion and traffic jams and, and all those things that lead to limiting people's access to affordable housing or employment uh, or care, uh, doctors or education or even access to each other what I've learned in living in Europe and America and, and different parts of Asia is that access to mobility is access to opportunity, economic opportunity through affordable housing and access to employment, but also access to social mobility and social interconnectivity. And that is being repressed in cities that don't have mass transit, that don't have a good urban mobility solution. If you then ask how many of those cities exist in that situation, there's over 4,000 cities on earth, 4,000 cities on earth that have mo significant mobility challenges and therefore significant economic opportunity challenges mm -hmm. and repression of quality of life. Of those 4,000, only 4% or 178 cities have a mass transit solution. Where I live in, in, in America, you have New York City, which is a very big, very dense city, but they have the New York subway and some people like it, some people don't, but at least they have it. But 96% yeah. of cities don't have it. And so when, when I think about your question, I would point to any one of those cities mm -hmm. where people are desiring to better themselves and to connect with each other, but are unable to because of a lack of mobility or a mobility solution that, that, that can scale to the demand. And I would pick any one of those because all of them need it. And that's really the mission in life. So I'm not trying to be difficult with your, your question. There is no one singular city. It's mm -hmm. a state being that I want to address. Uh, and, and so I really think of any one of those because they all need a solution like Glideways. And so as we think about the business model of Glideways and the day-to-day -day work, every decision we make is in mind with scalability. How do we take our mass transit solution and make it as scalable as possible for the other 96% of cities on planet Earth that are growing and that are desperately needing a mass transit solution. That's great that you've started to actually explain your answer because you've already mentioned uh, your company and uh, the somehow the idea of uh, your business. Could you please uh, tell us uh, what inspired you to start Glideways and uh, what actually you are doing to our audience? Sure. Um, so my journey started about eight years ago, somewhere around 2015 or 2016. 
And uh, it really came out of what I was saying a moment ago, which is that, you know, I was born in Holland and, and lived there a bunch of my life. I live in the United States and I've lived in Asia in, in, in equal parts almost. And through that experience, I've been able to experience living in cities and urban communities that have mass transit solutions and therefore don't suffer from endless congestion uh, on the roads. But I've also experienced a lot of cities that don't have it. And so I've been able to see the effect uh, of, of having a mobility solution, a mass transit solution. Sometimes you call that public transit, you know, mm-hmm. different words for the same idea. And the effect of, of those that have it with the effects that don't. And I began to actually feel the differences in people's economic opportunity or lack of economic opportunity and the vast untapped potential that people have to, if only they could get to work or if only they could get to affordable housing or if only they could get to education, how much better they can make themselves, their family, their local community, and the national and global communities. And so I began to ask myself, if some cities have it and many, many cities don't, why? Why is that the case? It's not a technical problem necessarily because uh, we have some cities that have a solution. So I began asking Mm -hmm. myself a question and I'm trained as an engineer, uh, electrical and mechanical engineering. And so I tackled the the problem from a technical perspective. And if you break it down, mass transit or or public transit Mm -hmm. is, is a need to move a large volume of people in a very short amount of time. And what I found in my research as I'm trying to answer this question of why isn't there more mass transit in this world? Why do only 4% of cities, 4% have a solution like this? You find out that there's only one solution in the market and that's train technology or rail technology. You can call it heavy rail, light rail, subway, monorail, different versions of train and train moves lots and lots of people. That's why cities, few cities have trains. But then you find out also that trains are very expensive to build. The capital cost to build the train is in the billions and billions of dollars. So mm-hmm. that's the first problem. The, the sticker price, the cost is so high that many cities and countries just can't afford it. And then the second problem is that the operational cost, which is what a business often cares about, your unit operational costs, which in the case of mobility is how many dollars per person for mile traveled do I have to spend? Or how much money does it cost me to move one person one kilometer or one mile of distance? Is also so high that the cost of moving someone on a train system is very high, much higher than the revenue you get by selling a ticket. Mm-hmm. And so as a business, trains lose money. Yes. And so as a yes. business, trains require a subsidy. And so if you add all that together, you get an economic problem where the capital cost is very high you operate at a loss uh, in perpetuity. And so therefore there's just a limit to how much you can build. And that's why cities on earth are subjected to only 4% uh, of, of, of proliferation with regard to mass transit because the other 96% literally cannot afford it. And so that's where I started. And then you go to the next part, which is very simple, which is how do I do the same thing at a lower cost? And that's where the technical innovation came in Um, And as many entrepreneurs may tell you the same story, regardless of the business or technology, doing the exact opposite is sometimes a good place to start uh, to think about how you solve a problem. And in the case of trains or mobility, mass mobility uh, or mass transit, the way we've always done it for the last 200 years is a paradigm of aggregation. We take a very large vehicle like a bus or a train and we fill that big vehicle with lots and lots and lots of people. And then we go from stop to stop to stop. That's what we do. We Mm -hmm. aggregate people into a big vehicle. Well, big vehicles are expensive and big vehicles that require their own infrastructure is really expensive. And so now you get a cost model that that is expensive to build. But you also get a problem that your your cost to move that train is, is spread out over the number of people in that train. So it's a utilization question. But a train is only full a minority of the time. A majority of the time, that train is half full or a quarter full Mm -hmm. or percent full. And so you're spreading a very high cost over fewer and fewer people most of the time. And so your unit economics don't scale. And so what we decided to do was let's do the exact opposite. Let's disaggregate mobility. Let's give every passenger their own vehicle and make that vehicle on demand instead of Mm pre-scheduled so that 
Uh, you don't wait for it, it waits for you. And can we design a system where we do uh, one party per vehicle, where the vehicle is off, you, you embark, you get on and off the vehicle offline, it merges into a continuous flow lane and it demerges wherever you want to get to. So you only have one stop, one stop, which is your stop, no stops for other people. And when you do that, well, a, a one person vehicle, or in our case, a four person vehicle is small. So small vehicles are cheaper. They require smaller infrastructure, which is very much cheaper. About 90% of the cost of any transit system is the infrastructure. So if I shrink the size of the infrastructure, mm -hmm. I dramatically shrink the costs. That's number one. Number two, if I don't do ride sharing and every passenger gets their own vehicle, I've become demand responsive, meaning I only deploy a vehicle when someone is paying for a ride. I don't have this problem of moving a train with a whole bunch of empty seats where I'm paying for empty seats being moved around. And so now I've gotten not a variable operational unit economic cost, but a fixed linear unit operational economic cost. And so there's some other things we do. I'm happy to explain it later. But basically what happens is you go from a high cost to a very low cost because we're shrinking the size. And we go from an operating cost that is dependent on utilization to an operating cost that is not dependent on utilization, which is very low. <laughs> and I give a passenger experience that is great. It's private. It's on demand. It has, it's a nonstop journey. So it's all, and it's always available because it's on demand. So it's 24 seven, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, not on someone else's schedule. And when you add all that up, you've got a value proposition, a service, mobility service, that's actually quite good. It's like Uber or a taxi or your own personal car, but without the congestion and at a very, very low cost. And so that's what we've done. We've cut the cost down by about 90%. We've made the unit operational cost mm -hmm. to not money. We actually make money. And we give a passenger experience that is really, really good. So people actually want to use it. Whereas trains, at least in America, are usually very bad and people don't want to use it. But you know, there's one more thing. One more thing, if I may, Alexandra, just to add. Yes. That we do. We can sell a ticket for the same price as a train ticket. We keep our prices mm -hmm. the same. But because our cost to deliver that ride is less than the revenue, we have money left over, which... By the way, that has not happened in about 100 years in, in mass mobility. What we decided to do with the money we have left over, instead of putting it in our own pocket, we thought about what is it that we're trying to solve? We're trying to solve the other 96%, over 4,000 cities on Earth need mass transit. And so we have to make a solution, the Glideway solution, that is scalable to 96% of the cities on Earth. How do you do that? And part of it is economic. You make it inexpensive. That's a start. You make it sustainable economically, that's a start. You make it easy to build, all those things are important. But let's look at the sales model. When you sell a mass transit system, the public pays for it. The government, the city, the municipality, mm -hmm. the people. Well, in many countries, raising money from the public is very, very difficult because nobody wants to pay more taxes. And that takes a long time. In the United States, it can take up to 20 to 30 years just to approve a new transit system. Well, a 20 to 30 year sales cycle is not scalable. Uh, other countries may be shorter, but it's still many, many, many years. And so what we decided to do is to take our profitability, the, the money we have left over after delivering a ride, and using a big chunk of that to pay for the building of the system itself. Mm -hmm. And that way we can go to a city that has a terrible traffic problem and, and wants to provide more economic opportunity and social mobility to people. And we can say, we will pay for the system. We Glideways will finance the cost of the system. So the city pays nothing, zero. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we don't need a subsidy because we don't lose money. So the city doesn't pay anything to build. The city mm -hmm. doesn't pay anything to operate it. We collect the revenue and the revenue pays for the building and for the operation mm -hmm. of this. In other words, we have now moved mass transit to the same level of business that selling coffee or pizza is, which is that we take customer risk. We are saying we believe people will buy our rides because they're good enough or, or, or good to use. And so passenger experience is a big part of driving ridership in the same way that if you sell coffee, well, if your coffee doesn't taste good, no one's going to buy your coffee. But if your coffee tastes good, you will sell more coffee. And our version is the same. We're bringing that principle back to the mm -hmm. public transit or mass transit, which for 100 years has not been the case. And so we're taking on the ridership risk. And that allows us to go to cities around the world and solve their 
congestion problem, their economic problem, their social equity problem, where we take the risk because we pay for everything. They still pay a, a, a fair ticket price that is the same as you know public transit fares would be, whether it's a bus or a train ticket, and we manage the rest. And that economic R&D, we did technical R&D and, and economic commercial R&D. How do we sell it? It's entirely new, but it's working because we've now actually built the product and sold it a few times under that model. And we believe that it will take time and it will be hard, but we believe that model is scalable to, again, meet over 4,000 cities of really desperate demand, ultimately to make the world a better and more prosperous place. Uh, it's a really detailed answer. And you even covered a lot of questions which I wanted to, uh, to discuss during our conversation. And as you said, really, traditional transportation system, they uh, often require uh, substantial subsidiaries from municipalities or government to remain operational. And you've described um, some of your a part of business model, uh, how it break away from this paradigm and offer a financial sustainable solution. And could you please deeply dive us into what are some potential economic benefits for cities and taxpayers? Oh, I would be happy to. So I think the first part is is the one I already mentioned, and it's it's to me in in a very um, in a very academic way, maybe the most exciting, which is that as a city grows, mm -hmm. uh, it needs more affordable housing to house those that growth and more employment to put those people to work and more education and care. And of course, commerce, retail is a big part of how a city economy grows. But the lifeblood of a city or the lifeblood of any economy is moving labor and moving goods, right? That's the basic of an economy. You move labor people and you move goods, things to buy or consume. So the artery of an economy is the ability to move people and things. And we can do that at a cost that the city itself doesn't have to pay for. The taxpayers that you mentioned don't have to bear that cost to build that kind of artery, that kind of uh, mobility infrastructure. And so that means that a city is now free with a new tool the Glideways tool, if, if I can be so direct about it, to plan urban environments that economically work better without the compromise of, gosh, we need more affordable housing, but how do we get people there? And, and how do we create communities that are socially sustainable, but still provide access to mobility because we don't have a lot of mobility or we have none at all? So to me, I see Glideways as an economic benefit because the city doesn't have to pay for it. And it can put that money in schools, in hospitals, in parks. It can put that money in what we call in America placemaking, which is mm -hmm. how do I invest in the in the city to make it a better living experience? Something Americans don't really understand as well as I think Europeans or, or even, even Asia does. Um, but now there's more money to do that. And so my argument is not cut taxes because you're not spending on mobility. No, 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 no. My argument is Use that money you would have spent on mobility in an unsustainable way and use it on other things. Build more schools, build mm -hmm. more bridges, build more parks. Um, I'm sure there's other things, it's not my area of expertise, but yeah. you have now more resources to build things better for more people. So I think that's the, the first one. And the second one for me is more on the social equity side. Um, we, we, we started Glideways with this idea of how do we equitize access to mobility because how do we equitize opportunity, economic opportunity and social mobility? Um, we like to say we're for the 100%, not the 1%. And, and the idea behind that is, is saying that if I can remove friction to someone wanting to transact business, either because they're working or they're buying, or people who want to connect with each other, family members, friends, social gatherings, if I can remove that friction, well, generally speaking, human civilization and human society does better when it has more ability to interact with each other. There's more business, the cost of doing business is lower, and human connections with each other, and therefore the fundamentals of human society at the local community level and at the bigger level strengthens. And, and in, in, in a very way that's very relevant probably to you is that democracies become stronger, our way of government becomes stronger, our education becomes stronger. And so 
If you think about what does a business try to do, a business tries to re remove friction. And for mm -hmm. us, it's uh, economic friction, friction of, of how do I find access to mobility if there even is a mobility solution or friction to, well, I want to see my, my grandma for dinner, but it will take me two hours to get there because she lives on the other side of town and traffic is so bad at night that it just, I, it, I can't do it. Well, that's not good. And so the friction is very high. We want to reduce friction. And I generally think that technical innovation, whether it's software, hardware, or political or educational innovation is a way of doing more with less. It reduces friction and provides a better value proposition. And I'll circle back to a comment I made a moment ago, which is that we say that we're for the 100%, not the 99%, but the 100%. And that means that if Glideways does its job right, if we design the technology and the passenger experience, we execute well, mm -hmm. is that even people who have the choice to use a luxury car, maybe they have one, maybe they have access to one, will still choose to use Glideways because it's a better value proposition. It's low cost. It gets you there with no traffic congestion, gets you there quickly, and it's safe and it's reliable. And if we do that, if people say, you know, I could take my luxury car, but I choose to use public transportation or mass transit, Glideways, well, now that to me is a sign of, of a developing society and bringing together the extremes of the haves and the have-nots, the wealthy and the not wealthy. We need to equitize opportunity for everyone. And that's what we try to do. And I think everyone benefits. Even if we do it a little bit, I think there's a broad benefit. So your solution is unique, we can say. Uh, and it takes for you a lot of efforts to be unique and to create your own market, let's say. As the founder and uh, chief strategy officer, what was the most unexpected challenge on this path? Let me answer it in two ways, if you have the time. The the first, it's what it's the very first thing you and I started talking about uh, half an hour ago, which is that resistance to change. Well, we always mm -hmm. expect it. I I was I am to this day uh, surprised at how emotional, not rational, but emotional, the legacy of the last 200 years of transportation technology is with people. Because I can make an argument that says Glideways is smaller, cheaper, faster, and more sustainable than a bus system or a train system, for example. And I can speak with people who agree with the objective but will still refuse to do something different because in their mind, mass transit means train or bus and mm -hmm. big things that require big expensive dollars. And if you say, no, 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 I can do the same job. I can do a better job with small things that are orchestrated very intelligently and cost less. It's People just don't want to do it. It sounds too good to be true and therefore people disbelieve and therefore people don't want to take the risk because was trying something new comes a risk. And I always knew that was going to happen. Happens in every industry, uh, software products, hardware products, anything else. But I, I underestimated the degree to which 200 years of cultural legacy that says public transit or mass transit must look like a train or must look mm -hmm. like a bus. It must be a shared vehicle with strangers that operates on someone else's schedule that may or may not be on time versus it could be something else. I, I underestimated that. So that was one of that is one of the biggest challenges. Um and to be fair, someone else much smarter than me once said that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And that just means we have to continue to build and continue to prove that our way is better than the old way, rather than saying, believe me, it is better. Please you try. And of course, it's a balance and you always find early adopters. And that's the key of an entrepreneur. Can you get to market with an early adopter quick enough to prove to the rest of the market mm -hmm. that you have a better product? And how do you stay motivated and inspired during uh, those uh, process of constantly proving someone about your idea, about your solution, that it works, it's neat? That is one of not the hardest, but I would say the second hardest thing for any entrepreneur to to be resilient to and i think my motivation comes from the conviction the belief that i have that our idea is better but really what that is is not that my idea is better than your idea it's a little different for me anyway maybe it's that way for for other people 
for me, it's that I know my idea can help more people. I know that our idea can, can elevate more people to live a slightly better life than they do without our idea. And that to me is the optimism that breathes life into my soul. That is what I like the most. Um, because at the end of the day, we're here to make our world a better place. We have the responsibility to tackle one of the many, 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 many long list of problems. There's many problems in our world. And I believe we, this generation, our generation and future generations have a responsibility to tackle, well, at least one of those problems on that long list and try to solve it a little bit. And, and that motivates me. And I think it motivates entrepreneurs in general. Through your journey as a founder, I've believed that you've learned a lot of lessons. And uh, if you were in the room full of first-time entrepreneurs, what would you advise them? The biggest journey I have gone through as an entrepreneur is learning about myself. Mm -hmm. It is a journey that, that says, I may have some strengths and I need to figure out what they are. I guarantee you I have weaknesses. I guarantee you I have a lot of weaknesses. And I need to understand what they are. And I probably cannot self-identify what those weaknesses are. I need other people. I need other people to trust me enough to tell me what my weaknesses are so that I can self-reflect and self, well, well, try to strengthen those weaknesses. And I've been an entrepreneur quite some time, both successful and not. I'm, I'm 43 years old, as I mentioned uh, to you earlier. I am just now, just now starting to learn that lesson. And I have a long way to go. And so I think at the end of the day, as an entrepreneur, you have challenges of technology, of business, uh, customer, political. You have lots of challenges. But to me, the biggest challenge has been with myself to understand authentically who I am and who I am not, not who I want to be, but who I actually am. And to solicit the feedback that I must have from other people that says, here are the weaknesses. Yes, you have strengths and here's what they are, but you have these weaknesses. And if you learn how to solve for some of those weaknesses, even a little bit, it will benefit you, which will then benefit everyone because of what you're doing as an entrepreneur. And so I think the authenticity and the humility of that self-reflection to me, to me has been the most important lesson. And I wish I had learned it earlier, but as we say, better late than never. Yes, as always. Mark, I want to thank you for, I can say that it was just jump into the, your story. It was really deep dive and I see your passion and I believe that you've built a really great company with such culture of passionate people. I want to thank you again for your open mindedness and it was a great time spending with you. Alexandra, thank you very much. It's been an honor and a pleasure to speak with you. I hope this is helpful. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to follow up. Eslavo Klanik.